British Columbia. Forest and desert, mountain and plain, lake and island, and rivers that flow down to the sea. Vladimir Kraina was born 73 years ago in Czechoslovakia. He's a botanist. And now here blooming, of course, shooting star, Trientalis latifolia. When young, they are pink, and when they are older, they are white. Botanist, teacher, and a fighter for causes he believes in, like political freedom. In the Second World War, he was head of intelligence with the Czech resistance. Who would suspect a botanist? But he was caught and only narrowly missed execution. After the war, he became a cabinet minister, but was once again imprisoned when the communist regime took over. He escaped and with his family fled to Canada. Vladimir is still fighting to keep something of BC's natural heritage as it has always been. Well, I am really very, very surprised that the tree is much older than I thought that it could be. It, I counted 300 25 rings here and I need to add to this tree to this height at least five maybe even more than five uh, years so that would be 330 years that's a pretty old age some of the Douglas fir trees are over a thousand years old towering up to 300 feet. The mild, moist climate of the coast has given magnificent stands, the like of which are not to be seen in Europe. Simply marvelous, marvelous. Marvelous indeed, but most of it is leased out to logging companies. Vladimir helped promote BC's Ecological Reserves Act, passed in 1971 which empowers the government to set aside certain areas for research. The question is, which areas and how many? Zero for person. Vladimir addresses the committee, which makes recommendations to the government. I hope that we shall reach about 10 times more still than we have up to now, <coughs> which to me, to a scientist, looks to be the reasonable part of our uh, <coughs> province of our most beautiful province in uh, Canada. Triangle Island, off the northern tip of Vancouver Island, has been set aside as an ecological reserve. A fancy name for a place where everything is left to nature. The headwaters of the Stikeen River in northern BC. Vladimir is proposing that there should be an ecological reserve here. For this great grassy plain, the Spatsizi Plateau, is summer pasture land for the largest caribou in the world, the Osborne caribou. Their grazing lands are being threatened by mining and forestry development, and their numbers are being thinned by hunters. Tommy Walker, now retired, was a hunting guide in the Spatsizi country here for many years. He's a friend of Vladimir. 
four six eight seventy two four six eight eighty and now I see uh, about eighty six I would say at least and there are still in the background uh, a smaller herd which I did not calculate they're so vulnerable I mean there's nothing to to shooting a caribou you might as well go out in the barnyard and shoot a cow there's nothing wrong with it but as I say to just go out and shoot a caribou is is pitiful. After a good deal of controversy, the spent CZ was declared a reserve of 130 square miles. No hunting. Surrounding it a park area where hunting will be permitted on a strictly limited scale, mainly for local people. Dr. Kraina has been at the University of British Columbia for almost 30 years now. He got his doctorate with highest honors from the famous Charles University in Prague in 1927. Then he took off on a two-year voyage around the world. He did botanical research in Hawaii, Japan. He studied in London, Paris, Berlin. He was lecturing on ecology decades before the word had any meaning for most of us. His lectures sometimes are a little difficult to follow, but he's been a great inspirer. And his graduate students have carried his ideas out into the world. There are now about a hundred reserves in BC. The smallest, one and a half acres. The second largest, 38 square miles, is the one named in his honor, the Vladimir Kraina Reserve in the Queen Charlotte Islands. Vladimir has come to visit a former student of his. Bristol Foster is director of BC's ecological reserves. He's also a zoologist up here to study the bird life. That's a hermit thrush. It's one of the finest songsters in Canada. But there are many other birds calling here as well. This way's the hermit thrush. That one's the song sparrow. And his winter wren as well. And fox sparrow. There's the fox sparrow behind us. The explorers included Foster's eight-year-old son, Mark, and Tom Radford, film director. The forest floor here is just covered with the holes of petrels, so we have to walk very carefully or we'll break through and destroy them. Come on, let's have a look in this hole and see what there is. Ah, oh, there's something. Here it comes. No. There, that's an adult. Leeches, petrol. Let's see if it has a egg or a baby. It's got something. Here's another adult leeches petrol. I guess they don't have anything in the nest yet except themselves. They're probably courting in there. They fly far out at sea, and we can protect petrels on land with ecological reserves, but no way can we protect them in the ocean where they spend, of course, most of their lives. And we simply can't protect them with super tankers full of uh, 200,000 tons of oil and single hulls going right past the shores here. Let's see what's in this burrow, Mark. Something soft, fuzzy. There, it's a baby petrel. And there's no adult in there. And the mother and father aren't in. They're a hundred miles out at sea, feeding. And they'll be back at night. That's why we don't see the adults flying around in the day. Let's have a look at its bill. It's got little tubes on top of its beak, and it uses these tubes to excrete the salt that it picks up in its food way out at sea. Mark goes to school in Victoria. His father has brought him along for the week's stay here. Vladimir remembers his own father, 60 years ago and 6,000 miles away from the Kraina Reserve. 
Well, I attended a school, a small school indeed, and that school was taught by my father. My life was formed in the way uh, that when I was about 14 years old, I decided that I shall be a scientist, that my field will be most likely botany, and besides that, that I shall do something for human beings as a I learned from my father. Haida. In the late 1800s, so many Haida died here that there were hardly anybody left to bury the people. They went up to Skidigat, those who survived at Skidans, and here's one of the people who did not survive. And look, they have very good teeth, no cavities, no chewing gum, no Coca-Cola, a very good diet. And the mosses are those which would occur only on material of this sort, that means on bones. This is peculiar moss, Isopetium stoloniferum. So this uh, young boy was probably killed by one of the diseases like smallpox or syphilis in the late 1800s. And they had many rituals to help uh, stylize and enforce their relationships, positive relationships with the environment. For example, when they're splitting a cedar plank off a tree to make a longhouse, they would go through a ritual of appeasing the cedar tree spirit so different from a modern logger with his chainsaw who slashes down the tree with the thought of the paycheck and not much else. Well, Tom, we are here in the cemetery which was founded with the help of missionaries who came here and who, with other white people, introduced some diseases which did not exist here before. There are some graves which are definitely, at least to me, much more pleasing. This type is so natural, and mind you, the plant which grows here is evidently a reaction to some rich material which was probably in the soil already. This plant, which is Myanthemum dilatatum, requires quite a lot of calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus. Our body is out of many elements which will survive uh, maybe in new bodies or in new life and through new life through the plants maybe in uh, animal life and later on even in a human life or in other words that all that is a continuation of cycling which is so well known to the uh, scientists that nobody doubts about them Young Vladimir spent the year 1929 here in Hawaii. He collected specimens up to then unknown to botanists. He was fascinated by the giant tree ferns. A much less spectacular species was named after him, Plantago crayini. But there were species of plants he would never see in bloom. They now rest as dried up remains in a museum in Honolulu. They'd been collected by Captain Cook when he visited here 200 years ago. Captain Cook met his end in a skirmish on a beach here. At the time of Vladimir's first visit, these plant species were already extinct. Vladimir has returned here many times. He spent a year as a visiting professor at the University of Hawaii. I think to see here 50, 60 people was probably the utmost. Uh, that was rather exceptional population of visitors uh, in 1929. 
Now you can see that that has been changed. I am not surprised that the people like to come here, but the question is only, should we really so much sacrifice for tourism that there are hardly too many original beauties left here over? And as we shall see maybe later on, many things were so substantially spoiled that it will be never recovered. The third person in this exploration trip is Charles Lamera, who studied under Vladimir. As we have seen in the case of Captain Cook and the vanishing species, you can't blame all the ecological changes on the influx of tourists. There are rats that have been brought into the islands by man, and the trees here are just, again, not adapted to rats and they've done such things as strip bark off the trees in many places. Here's the damage, um, and it's much more there, uh, higher up, as you can see. It's serious, and sometimes quite uh, a lot of damage is causing death of the whole plant. You better see the bark. And you can see the bark. You can see the, the wood there, the bark is completely peeled off. So all these things are tied together, they all interact. The birds, the trees, Rats. And the red swim. Five thousand feet up on the misty slopes of Mauna Kea, the island's loftiest volcano, it's not just individual trees which are threatened but an entire ecosystem. These branches have lots of moisture on them. The moisture condenses on the branch as the fog comes in in the afternoon. And this condensation on the leaves is a source of the major part of the moisture for the trees in here. The soil is very dry, but the, the trees get this bath at least once a day. It all comes from the fog, and it, this then creates another problem. When the trees disappear, the mountain actually gets drier because you no longer have this added moisture that the trees are dropping on the ground. The major trees around here are the Mamani trees, we can see here. And they are interesting in themselves, but the green seed pods on those trees also form the major food for a bird called the palila, which is one of the very rare and endangered species of Hawaiian birds. This whole ecosystem is in trouble because of herds of wild sheep, feral sheep, domestic sheep that have gone wild, which are destroying the young plants and preventing any regeneration in the forest. And when the mamani trees are gone, obviously the palela that live on them are going to disappear also. So this is really a, a critically endangered habitat right now. Now you see there just aren't any young trees here. There are a few old ones that are in the process of, of dying, but there aren't any young ones. And this is because when grazing animals are in this kind of mamani forest, they find the mamani seedling very tasty. So you see the dead skeletons of trees, you see old dying trees, but no young ones, no teenagers, no middle-aged ones. At 9,000 feet, they head into a wasteland. One of the first botanists to study the forests of the Pacific was David Douglas, after whom those great fir trees on Vancouver Island were named, and he visited this exact site 150 years ago. David Douglas, in the early 1830s, wrote about sitting under the Mamani trees at this elevation, eating strawberries, and talked about the sublime appearance of the mountain. And this, is, this pilo tree is sort of the last tree in what was once a, a, a beautiful, a sublime forest. Every hundred years, a thousand feet less of forest. 
And it all began when the explorer Captain Vancouver presented a local chieftain with one pair of sheep, a gift to Hawaii. We witnessed to change the surface of the earth into something that resembles the landscape of the moon. River valleys in the interior of Vancouver Island have been logged over for the last 80 years. Cut, reseeded, cut again. Today there's only one watershed of any significance left untouched on eastern Vancouver Island, the Tsitika River Valley. And the loggers want to get in there. Roderick Haig Brown was a logger. That's how he started out here on the coast. He became a teacher, a magistrate, and a famous writer on the joys of fishing. Two years before his death, Haig Brown addressed a citizens' meeting called together by the provincial government to air their views on the proposed opening up of the Tsitika Valley to development. It is all gone except for this valley. And we have never stopped in all that time to take a proper look at what we were doing. We have just devastated one valley after another. A spokesman for the industry puts his case. I think our logging practices over the past 20 years or thereabouts have improved immeasurably, as so many people in this room know. The thing is, we live on this island. And what's important is a quality of life for ourselves and for our children. I feel this is very, very important. If we don't do that, we're selling our children's birthright. You're preserving the, the wildlife, but you're taking away our livelihood by saying, don't go in there and keep the fish alive, keep the animals alive. It's really marvelous that we are in free country that we can speak as openly as we wish and that we are permitted to speak on meeting of this sort and through this meeting also to the government. Ecological reserves will be serving, serving for next several hundred years, if not thousand years, especially to the foresters who will learn from them the prudence by which they should act. Now, up to now, foresters are harvesting forests which they never established by themselves because they were established by the nature. This is fine, it's excellent, our uh, industry is really growing from that and very well. But we need to have excellent industry in the future. And to be able to have that, we need to know how nature operates, how nature operated, and not to make any mistakes. Two years later, the decision was handed down. The last valley will be harvested. Thank you. 
I feel it is a, a great privilege to be able to fight for proper ideas of getting human life the best for everybody, not only for a person concerned. That's an idea which can be fought for. Vladimir has won some and lost some, but he's always had a lot of fun trying. As one of his students, and like many of BC's foresters, I camped with Vladimir and his crew of students for eight weeks one summer about 26 years ago. After a day in the forest, Vladimir would return triumphantly, I'm afraid, with a, a satchel of edible mushrooms, he said. <laughs> Each dinner he made mushroom soup for us. It was kind of him, I suppose. He, <laughs> he said the scientific name of the mushrooms was Boletus Socituas. <laughs> Four pounds of Boletus socket to us. <laughs> Two quarts of water from the lake and a pinch of salt, eight pounds. <laughs> After we'd had a few sips, uh, Vladimir would then say in flawless English, the good thing <laughs> about Boletus socket to us is that from two to three days, the effect does not take of the poison.